Good morning, everybody. My task is to describe something to you about the quantitative genetics view of heterosis. And from that perspective, I'm going to say something about why it occurs, have a digression into, um, from an outsider's point of view as to why it seems so fascinating to molecular biologists, mention briefly something about heterotic groups, and finally touch on what I think is going to be important in hybrid breeding in the future. But I'd like to start with something more simple, which is to consider genetic progress in an inbred crop, uh, here wheat, and this remarkable improvement in yield that we see over time in wheat yields in the UK, we know has been predominantly driven by the efforts of plant breeders. And we also know how they've achieved that. Essentially, they make crosses between elite lines and look in the progeny to find individuals that they hope uh, are better than the best parent, as shown here. And the majority of lines will be mediocre. They'll get the, some that are worse, of course, too. And this transgressive segregation, we know, is caused by the dispersion of favorable alleles favorable loci between the two parents. And that's uh, illustrated here. We have um, two inbred parents here, uh, each with two loci, an A locus and a B locus. If you imagine the capital letters as increasing the trait value and the lowercase letters as contributing nothing, then that cross will be made. And as a result of the breeder's efforts, they will identify some lines uh, at a low frequency, which will, in essence, have a greater uh, proportion of capital letters than the best of the parents. So without transgressive segregation, plant breeding doesn't work. We know plant breeding does work, therefore there is transgressive segregation, and we know it's caused by the dispersion of favorable alleles. Now, this has some relevance to the explanations of heterosis, which I'll now go on and describe. And there are two major explanations. There's some bells and whistles that can be added to these, but I'm going to stick with the simple explanations. And the simplest of all is that heterosis is explained by overdominance. That's illustrated here. I've got a single locus, uh, homozygous in each of two parents, producing a heterozygous F1. And I've given those and uh, the uh, inbred parents an arbitrary score of, of one each. They don't have to be identical, but they are here. And the heterozygous F1 has a score of two. So it's a very simple single locus explanation. It has some uh, emotional appeal, if you like. There's this, this fact that the, the, the heterozygous loci, uh, for some reason, just happen to always do better than the uh, inbred loci. Uh, on the downside, it's hard to see why that sort of single locus advantage should be there so often. And the evidence that this is a uh, pervasive explanation of heterosis across crops and traits isn't particularly good. The alternative explanation is that heterosis is explained by dispersed dominant genes. And I've illustrated that here. Here are my two loci again, uh, homozygous in each of the two parents, giving rise to a heterozygous F1. I've allocated phenotypes of one to the two parents, and I've got a phenotype of 1.5 in that F1. Underlying that is a very simple genetic model where each of the homozygous lo loci contributes one to the overall phenotype. Uh, the lowercase homozygotes here <coughs> contribute nothing. So we've got a one in this line coming from the big A, big A locus there, a one here coming from the big B, big B lo locus. Those favorable loci are dispersed between the parents. The score you get in the F1 depends on the sum of the score of the heterozygotes at each of those two loci. And I've given that a score of 0.75 here. So we've got a total score of 1.5 for our heterotic F1. 
But you can see that that uh, 0.75 then doesn't represent overdominance. It doesn't even represent complete dominance. It's just 0.75 is closer to 1 than it is to 0. This model is the sort of uh, standard at the moment, I would say, against which any alternative is judged. There's, there's better evidence that for this than anything else. Uh, it doesn't require overdominance and some explanation as to why that is occurring. It does require that dominance should be predominantly unidirectional. So, for example, if the um, heterozygous class at the B locus had a uh, score of 0.25 rather than 0.75, then that F1 would come out with a total score of 1 again. There'd be no heterosis. It does require dispersion of favorable loci between the two parents, and it's a bit boring, really, compared to the heterozygous advantage explanation. But uh, on the plus side, we know that there's dispersion in the sorts of crosses that breeders make, because if there wasn't, plant breeding wouldn't work, and it does. And there is directional dominance, because if uh, there wasn't, we wouldn't get inbreeding depression, essentially, for the traits which we're working with. So I digress a bit into uh, what, from an outsider's point of view, seems to be a molecular view of heterosis. And there's been great enthusiasm for trying to explain it over the years, such uh, with not particularly great success, such that by 2007, there were still statements being made about it being enigmatic. Now, I think some of this enthusiasm has come from a focus on trying to explain the overdominance explanation, the exciting explanation, rather than the dull and boring dispersed dominant uh, or partially dominant loci explanation. But it certainly seems the case that every time that there's some advance made in uh, molecular biology and molecular genetics, sooner rather than later, it will be used to advocate that we found the secret of heterosis. Uh, in a somewhat overhyped manner, I would say. So we've got revolutionary new methods, new explanations, unifying theories. Um, genes might still be involved, a bit of a relief. Um, and uh, on it goes. That is not a uh, complete list, and I would expect if I was to give a talk like this in two or three years' time, this list would have expanded. Now, clearly, those explanations can't all be correct, but they could all be partially correct. These exciting new discoveries that have been made in um, molecular genetics and molecular biology will have some effect, at least in some cases, on the traits with which breeders are interested. And that, in, in its own, is, is very useful information to have. They may also happen to correlate with the dominance variation that uh, is driving heterosis and therefore um, contribute to, to that too. I would say that you can't routinely test this just by growing two parents in an F1. And some of those quotes that um, I've just been through come from experiments that don't involve much more than that. A quantitative genetics approach would be to uh, partition variation. Uh, this is what quantitative geneticists do. Some would say it's about all they can do. Uh, but we like to partition the variation we see into genetic and environmental effects, and we can go further and partition the genetic variation into additive effects and the dominance effects and other effects as well, but I'll stop at this. Now, whatever the new method is or the new prediction uh, proposal, we can assess the extent to which that will account for additive variation and dominance variation. Now, firstly, it's only if those prediction accuracies are uh, large at all that this will have any interest whatsoever within breeding programs. And secondly, and possibly a bit more tentatively, I think you could say it's only if the, uh, whatever the uh, thing is, happens to be accounting for uh, more of the dominance variability than it is the additive variability that you could go on to say, we've got something here that seems to be explaining uh, heterosis and heterotic effects rather than just plain genetic variation. I'll touch briefly on heterotic groups 
we'll hear a lot more about this in the next talk, I think. By a heterotic group, I'm, I'm referring to the uh, concept that you can find subpopulations such that when crosses are made between lines from different subpopulations, the hybrids that are produced tend to be better than the hybrids that you get when you make the crosses within subpopulations. And this is important in hybrid breeding uh, projects. Uh, sometimes these fall into your lap, sometimes you may have to search for them, but they will also evolve, they can be created during the breeding process. Again, there's nothing um, uh, mystical about them, really. Uh, the, the classic example is, is shown here for maize. In Europe, the uh, heterotic groups fell into our lap, basically. In maize, they weren't present at the start of hybrid breeding. They've evolved as that breeding has uh, progressed. The broad explanation for what's going on is something which, in population genetics, is called the Wallend effect. If you've got populations and they're subdivided, they will di diverge genetically. That divergence may occur through a foundry effect, it may occur through drift, it may occur through selection, but diverge they will. Diverged populations have reduced heterozygosity compared to the population that you would have if you put everything back together again, if you like. That's what the Wallend effect is. And it follows, it can't help but follow, that crosses between diverged populations will show greater heterozygosity than crosses that are made within populations. So if there's any relationship at all between heterozygosity and hybrid vigor, and there is, we will find, on average, more heterosis coming from crosses between populations than uh, within. That doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to get the best hybrids from such crosses. You also still require the dispersion of favorable alleles between those subpopulations. And if you get that as well, you may well have some useful uh, uh, heterotic groups. So really, there's no mystery to heterosis. Uh, uh, the base explanation that everything else must build on, I feel, is the dispersion of favorable dominant alleles between the parents. Uh, more interesting questions are just in general, what's the source of genetic variation for economic traits? I don't really care whether it's additive variation or dominance variation. If that can be accounted for, breeders can start working potentially more efficiently. And possibly more ac academically, why is dominance directional for traits like yield at least in some species. I'll finish off with what uh, Alan, Ar Alan Archibald from the Roslin Institute has referred to as the quantitative geneticist's revenge, and this is genomic selection. So for those of you that don't know, genomic selection is a way of uh, calibrating high-density genetic markers against the traits that we wish to predict, yield predominantly. And it works, and it's in the process of revolutionizing animal breeding at the moment, and it is undoubtedly being incorporated into uh, the major international hybrid uh, crop breeding programs too. And it's called the quantitative genetics revenge by Alan because he's saying that essentially we can, we can bypass all the explanations for how traits are are made up and the need for physiology and so on, we can go straight from the thing we want to select, yield to the high density genomics information that we've got. I don't think he necessarily meant that as a compliment to us, but I'm gonna take it as one. Um, and my prediction for the future would be that the major improvements in breeding efficiency that we see in the next 10 years will come from the implementation of genomic selection rather than anything else. And uh, with that, I'll finish. Um, I'll acknowledge um, uh, some uh, co-workers in NIAB who've helped formulate my views, and um, John Hickey from the Roslin Institute. And thank you very much for listening.